Here it is. Here is the moment that people are going crazy about. Danny Medvedev, who's had a great tournament here. This is the, maybe the best match of the tournament. It was a really good match, for, especially for a three-set. Best three-set match of the tournament. Medvedev plays a great match. Tsitsipas plays an even better match. And this is how it ends with this. What happens after the underhand serve? Steph comes up with the backhand down the line. Incredible stuff. Uh, Sasha Zverev looks very good. This is what it looks like now. This is what we got. By the way, Paul Anacone. I was making fun of whichever commentator. I'd never heard her before, but she was saying Davidovich. It's not. It's it's Davidovich Fokina. Davidovich. And now I notice Paul Anacone is saying Davidovich. Davidovich. Okay. Anyways, this is what we. This is what we got. Uh, Davidovich didn't have enough to take on Sasha Zverev. Didn't think he'd be able to hang with him with the firepower. Steph Sissipas, of course, will be able to. Uh, I think night matches are over after we see Djokovic and Berrettini. Is there some danger there with one last Italian? Let's talk about Italians for a moment. Uh, Yannick Sinner, I, I had uh, pretty high hopes for him. You know, I thought he was going to really take it to Rafa. thought they were going to be very t tight sets from start to finish and that Rafa would win it in four sets. But this attempt was not as good as last year's attempt. Uh, maybe uh, maybe some people would have thought, I thought, it would have been a, a better match from center this year. It appears that uh, he went backwards. Rafa was able to really take care of him. Maybe Rafa just needed a little more information on the guy. But it, it started well. He served for the set, and he completely choked. We're talking a, a, some unforced errors followed by a double fault down Love 40 serving for the first set. Yannick Sinner, when you do that, and I'm sure he knows better than anyone, you do that, Rafa knows everything he needs to know. He's ready to take over the match, and he sure did with the bagel in the end. It started great, but then it went to Rome burning. Rome is on fire. Stop the fire. Stop the fire. Let's do another Italian. Not Berrettini. We've got some hope for Berrettini. Musetti, who... Okay, you know, everyone wants to say, who's the next Roger Federer? I like to do it myself. Say, oh, that was Federer-like from some players. Tsitsipas is Federer-like in some ways. But if we want to really talk Federer-like shots and magic, uh, Lorenzo Musetti was pulling off those kind of shots, especially uh, some of the stuff he did in those two tie-break sets to take the first two sets. Not long after that, Djokovic comes out, hits this shot, falling over on the ground, Wins the point, and what do you know? Rome is burning again. Oh my God, it's on fire! Somebody save the Italians! Throw some, douse the Italians in water! Rome is on fire. But there is one, there is one Italian left, and he might be able to save Rome. <laughs> Welcome to the Coffee Break Tennis Podcast. Uh, tomorrow you'll see my beautiful face clean shaven. I know some people out there, they really don't like the, uh, the stubble or the beard. You know, I see comments. Uh, you know, comment. It's like Super Mario Brothers, right? Yeah. So, so leave a nice comment if you want to want me to level up. You get that mushroom. You go bloop bloop bloop. You know, you you grow like in a in, in Super Mario Brothers. By, by the way, take a look at these guys. This was earlier in uh, the tournament when there was a couple of Italian. Oh, it was uh, Gianluca Mag Maga, Maggio, whatever his name is. And Sinner, I think, was the match. Two Italians playing. So he had the he had all the Italian uh, Super Mario Brothers there. Anyways. I read a nice comment, and it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I get the mushroom. And then I, I read a really negative comment, like, Matt, you should uh, jump off a bridge. Yeah, you suck. I read that, and it's like, doo, doo, doo. you know, you, you hit the bad guy in Mario, and you, and you shrink down. You're like, all right, all right, I'm done looking at comments. So if I see a few good comments in a row, I keep reading. I see a couple bad ones. I'm out. Anyways, why, why was I talking about comments? I don't know. Oh, I, I see comments, and I know some people really hate it when uh, when I start growing facial hair, but it's it's all what Federer does. When Merck is away, the Federer will play, right? The uh, the Federer facial hair will come out. And uh, I like to do the same thing. I like to copy Federer. But now that Federer is, you know, long gone from this tournament and on his way to Wimbledon, I've clean shaven. So tomorrow, after we see how to fill out this little bracket here, put it back on there. Let's let's take a good look at this. Berrettini quietly making his way through to the quarterfinals. I know the Fed fans were looking at him all along thinking, mm, this guy could beat Fed. But that match didn't happen. He got the walkover. He's going to play, and I think it's the last night match, and I think the Peacock is done. Thank, thank God. The Fedcock is shut down for now. 
Fedcock will return to Wimbledon. And his Peacock's done. I, I, God, I hope Peacock doesn't have exclusive broadcast rights to some Wimbledon matches. I don't think they will, but you never know. It should be ESPN here in the States. Uh, anyways, Berrettini and Djokovic. It's going to be a night match. Sitsipas, it helped him. They needed a day match. Medvedev himself, what did he say? What did he say? I got the article here. Oh, did I even talk about Musetti and his fake uh, injury thing yet? You know, people on Twitter were really angry, and it it looked, I thought he was injured. I believed it. You'll have to decide for yourself. I'm going to play you a clip. This is what he says. The word, and uh, I took him, like, uh, the first two sets. Then, uh, I mean, he started to play really good, and, um, and then uh, I had uh, some problems uh, with the with my physical part, and uh, yeah, I think I have to work there. And um, of course, the match with Cecchinato, uh, I mean, uh, was like uh, five sets, three hours. His powers? What what the heck is he talking about? It, it sounds like basically like. He had some lower back pain and some fitness issues, like his body's not used to playing this much best of five. I mean, how could it be? This is his first time in a main draw at a major. Uh, so he, he's not used to it. You don't surrender. That's a bad look. Like I was saying earlier, he hit some shots that were, you know, the Fed magic. You, you don't really see, you know, you see other players sometimes come up with one. Musetti was coming up, you know, it, it was like 2008 Wimbledon, like, just some of the, it, obviously he wasn't saving match points like Federer was doing against Rafa, but he was coming up with these shots that were just unbelievable. The most important times, the most clutch moments, he was coming up with these shots. The back, the one-handed backhand up the line from Musetti is is just gorgeous. Uh, um, Damien says that, Damien Byrne, I, I refer to him a lot. He's uh, he's always saying stuff on, you know, he'll, he'll comment here, say something on Twitter. He's, he's a good follow on, uh, on the Twitter. He's... Knows his tennis. He's a really good player. He's got a nice one-handed backhand himself. I've seen video of him. He said this guy is guaranteed future number one. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously he's got the talent to do it. But now that this is here, take a listen. This is the rest of what he said. Did you have some kind of injury or was it just simply the, the physical toll of, of the match? No, no, no. It's uh, it's not an injury. It's uh, we're just like a little bit of cramps and uh, a little bit of low pain, uh, uh, low back pain, and uh, I was uh, not anymore uh, able to to win a point, and so uh, was not really. Um, grateful also for the crowd that. Uh, that were there, so I decided like to retire because there were no chance that I could win a point. It's not an injury. I mean, he straight up said it. How, how do you argue with that? I, and I, I kind of, I think the whole tennis world missed this because, right? He said this yesterday. Uh, yeah, had to work a little harder to find his presser. It wasn't on the Roland Garros uh, app like a lot of the other pressers are, the nice ones. Uh, I listened to it myself and it kind of, I don't know, it was late at night and I was kind of out of it. I was wanting to make a show yesterday and I was just so tired by the time I was uh, at that point doing it. I just, maybe I missed it. I was tired, didn't make a show. And I think I missed this part where he said it's not an injury. I heard him talking about it, saying he couldn't win a point. I thought he meant he couldn't win a point because he was so badly injured. So I guess a lot of people missed it, including myself. But no, he literally said it's not an injury. I mean, he's young. So I'm not going to say he'll never be a world number one, but that was a, a disappointing thing to see. Should have took his beating like a man, like many Djokovic fans out there were saying when he didn't just take take the bagel, take the two bagels. Jeez. All right, but there's one more Italian, and he's going to have a night match, just like Tsitsipas. It helped him against, um, not Zverev, against Medvedev. We just saw Medvedev lose to Tsitsipas today. The conditions slow down at night, hurt Federer, Dominic Kepfer really helped him. He was able to blast through those conditions. Uh, and we saw another match like that. It, you know, it was, I guess those are the best matches of the tournament so far. Definitely wasn't Nadal and center. <laughs> that was not the best match. I mean, there were. that was an exciting first set. We'll give Yannick center a good set, but I'm sure he's not happy with that at all, and he shouldn't be. Uh, the first two sets, Djokovic and Mazzetti, very good stuff. Like I said, such pure magic. That was some of the best stuff, the way that match ends. It's a disgrace, as Johnny Mac might say. 
Uh, Sitsipas met a very good match, start to finish, good stuff. Sitsipas came out really hot, really taking care of business on the serve. Bottom line for me, the night match screwed Medvedev. He was pissed off. That's what I was looking for. What did he say? They chose Amazon. Medvedev says Grand Slam preferred Amazon to people. If you're in the U.S., you probably don't know what that means. You don't know because uh, Amazon doesn't broadcast tennis here in the U.S. That's a European thing or maybe more countries, but definitely or continents, whatever. Definitely uh, that's a, a Europe thing. Anyways, uh, let's see. What did he say? In terms of sporting fairness, we would like each of the top players to play at some point in the evening. So, okay, that's what uh, Forget You Guy Guy Forget said. And, and they were fair, right? They let all these top players. Now, if we want to talk about why didn't they put the women's matches in there, maybe that's not fair. I, I mean, it comes down to where's the demand, who wants to see these matches, and honestly, Azarenka should just be happy that she didn't have to play the stupid night matches because the, con the conditions suck. You're in this empty stadium. You can hear a pin drop. Every sound is annoying. It all started with uh, the Sandman. Tennis Sandgren had a night match with uh, Djokovic, and at one point he was yelling at camera people saying, you're the loudest cameraman I've ever heard in my life. Stuff like that. Uh, we've seen people upset with the lights. Uh, well, that's before it gets dark when that's the problem, like Rafa. But um, I think uh, Sandman was also upset with that because it wasn't quite dark yet when they started their night match. Or maybe I'm misremembering that. It doesn't matter. Anyway, wh why would you want to play in this empty stadium thing? It sucks. Things sucks. All right, and turn, turn, let me find Medvedev's quote here. Okay, it's actually funny because just yesterday I started the third season of some show called Drive to Survive. It's about Formula One race cars. And uh, Medvedev is saying, it's funny because I just started yesterday, the third season, and I think the first or second episode is called Cash is King. When the pandemic started, they're in Australia ready to race, and they ask Lewis Hamilton what he, th he's a racer, if you don't know, what he thought about racing and the conditions the world was in right now. He said... I don't know what we're doing here. So they asked him, why do you think they're going to make you race? And he said, cash is king, baby. And it's the same thing here. Uh, and then later on, he says, it's good when you have sponsors and everything because that's how we tennis players can make money. So at least Danny Medvedev, he knows where the bread is butter. But he's a very honest interview. It's, it's, I love Medvedev for that. And when you're very honest, funny stuff comes up. You're going to naturally be a funny guy if you're going to be uh, totally honest with the world and the media. So, uh... God bless Medvedev for that. We appreciate him. Anyways, it definitely, it hurt Medvedev. He would have played in front of people. Would have been better for him. And more importantly, I think the conditions would have been a little faster. Like he said, he liked it here because it was hot. And it was playing like a clay court, right? The, the clay gets hot and baked like a cake. And it's more firm, like a hard court. And uh, Medvedev, like you know, it's easier to move on for someone like Medvedev when you bake that clay in the sun all day. Anyway, so... Same thing with Djokovic and Berrettini. Uh, it's going to be a night match. Berrettini is going to have a real shot tomorrow against Djokovic, so keep your eye on that one. Schwartzy D, our friend Diego Schwartzman, I don't think he's going to be able to do too much against Rafa, but you know, it, it's like David Ferrer. He's a great warrior. He's overpowered by Nadal no matter what happens. It's best of five. You know, he, he beat him. On clay last year in best of three, can he beat him in best of five? Maybe if you put it on the night match. Because remember, last year the conditions were kind of like that when Schwartzman beat Nadal. But we're going to have the daytime match. And uh, it depends how long the first couple women's matches go. But I see Rafa coming through in three sets against Diego. But of course, I always give Diego a shot to take a set off, even someone as great as Nadal on the clay. Because uh, he's a true, true little warrior, Diego Schwartzman. And, and again, you know, he's playing better. His confidence is going to be up. So you better believe he thinks he can win. He knows he has a shot. <sighs> when I, now I say that now, and I really wonder deep down, does Schwartzman believe he can beat Rafa tomorrow? I don't know that, actually. I can't say that. But he, he knows that he can take a set. He knows that he's a good player. He knows he beat Rafa on clay, even if the conditions were a lot different. So... Of course, you got to watch that match, but the real match to watch tomorrow, Berrettini Djokovic. All right, let me look in uh, my magic box of tricks. I, I, I want to tell you about Yannick Sinner for a little bit because, you know, we've talked about the serve with him. And, you know, he, he can hit it pretty big. You know, Matteo Berrettini, they asked him, uh, not Berrettini, excuse me, uh, Musetti. They asked Musetti if, he, you know, he could take a piece of Sinner's game for himself and what he thought. And he thought, Sinner would like my variety. Yeah, duh. And, and maybe. 
You know, because Sinner looked very one-dimensional. Like, uh, he, he had no plan B, for sure, in that match against Rafa. But I don't think he really needs it so much. You know, he could get better at the net. Stuff like that is always valuable. But it, it really comes down to setting himself up with the serve. And let's look at this piece from Amy Lundy. And she has another name. She's got, like, two last names or something. I don't know. I'm, just call it Amy Lundy. She wrote a piece at 538.com. Uh, you know, she's out there in the tennis world. She's on the tweeters and uh, the instant grams and stuff like that. I'm sure you've heard of her at some point. Uh, she did a little study here on the doll and the third shot. Craig O'Shaughnessy talks about the third shot. It's serve plus one, right? Your serve is number one shot. The bad guy's return is number two shot. And then what you do next is the third shot. And here, Rafa is the king. We showed you the graph earlier in the tournament where it shows the spread, right? It's, and I called it like uh, the goat ratio. You go two-thirds in the, the obvious better direction. Rafa, it's forehand cross court to a backhand. And then one-third of the time, to keep them honest and to get some free points from just surprising them, you go the other way. Of course, this only works if you're able to make that shot work. Well, Rafa makes it work really well here, especially with his very high bounce. Gets a very high bounce with his forehand. You know, other players like Jack Sock had a forehand that was Rafa-like. Uh, but but no one's really mastered how to use it the way Rafa has, especially on the clay. There's so much more to Rafa than that. But this is a huge part. So let's take a look. The difference between Nadal's third shot and that of his French... You know what? Let me backtrack a little, explain the little thing in case you didn't hear what I'm saying. I compare what Rafa does. It's the first forehand after the first serve. It's the third shot. It's the serve plus one shot from Rafa, a forehand. He makes it the forehand about 80% of the time. It's very difficult to return Rafa's serve and force him. To make a return so good that Rafa has to hit a backhand, it's happening less than 20% of the time usually. So Rafa will take that forehand and really crank it cross court. And most of the time, as Amy uh, Lundy, I think Dahl is the other last name in there, D-A-H-L, if you want to look her up, uh, most of the time, as she sees here, it's either going to be a winner from Rafa or an or an error that he forces or an error where, where he misses because he's going for this shot. He knows this is the right shot, and occasionally he'll miss it. He doesn't settle for anything else. He's not just going to poke that thing back in play. And, and then sometimes he'll go the other way towards the forehand of the opponent. That's what I'm talking about, the ratio. About a little more than two-thirds of the time, his first forehand is going to be cross-court to the backhand, opening up the can opener. If he has to hit... The fifth shot, right? The opponent's shot would be the fourth. Rafa's next shot would be the fifth. Usually, he's done enough damage with that cross-court forehand to finish with the next shot or go to net. I saw another thing comparing stats of Djokovic and Nadal so far throughout the tournament. And uh, and Nadal is, uh, you know, they're pretty close overall. Uh, Djokovic is serving better, hitting more aces, less double faults, which used to be very different if you go back a while ago. But Djokovic has really improved the serve. But the one thing that stood out is uh, Rafa... He sets himself up so well. He's doing a better uh, conversion. I think, uh, let me see it really quick. At net, Djokovic is winning 65.6% of the time, and Nadal at the net is winning 78.7% of the time. And that's because, you know, this third shot is so good from Rafa that usually the next shot is something where he can come to net and have a very easy volley. Rafa is so effective at the net because... He always goes when the time is right, and he only goes when the time is right. You, you know what I mean? Like, he doesn't let those opportunities pass by too much. He's gotten better and better at that over the years. Uh, you know, Djokovic and Federer, too. I mean, Federer especially, he really had to start making the net a big part of his game. Rafa uh, might not do it quite as much, but he does it a lot. He do does it more and more year after year. And that third shot is so good that usually Rafa will have a very easy finish at the net waiting for him sometime soon after that third shot, if not immediately after. Anyways, difference between Nadal's third shot and that of his French Open opponents is going back to Amy Lundy's, uh, Amy Lundy Dahl at 538.com. The difference between Nadal's third shot and that of his French Open opponents unveils a surprising peak in the Nadal's ways and means for success. A little ways and means committee joke there, reference there. Uh, at the 2020 French Open, when Nadal hit the third shot of a rally, he either hit a winner or elicited an error from his opponent 110 times. According to stats from Roland Garros, data provider Infosys, Nadal's opponents, meanwhile, won points on their, sh their shot just 58 times, roughly half of Rafa's 
number. In tennis, when a match win can hinge on just a few well-timed points, a difference as large as 52 points hangs heavily over the statue. And you can see the stats here. When the doll's serving on that third shot, these are winners made and errors elicited by Rafa and his opponents on the third shot of each rally during the 2020 French Open. 45 times he had a winner. 65 times he hit a shot that was so good the opponent missed the next ball, right? He drew an error. He forced an error. It's 110. The opponent's putting 30 winners down and only 28 errors drawn from the doll. Big part of that is Rafa is so far back. He usually, right, he can get a good deep return, so it makes it harder. He hits that really high ball from way back, and then he slips in. But he also, you know, he's really good at defending from that position, so it's very difficult to do any serious damage. And a lot of that is the height of the return. Rafa usually gets you a high enough ball and deep enough to where it's not an obvious, uh, you know, serve plus one scenario for that opponent of Rafa's. And and Rafa also, you know, he just plays great defense on top of that. So it, it's hard to finish him with that third shot, whereas with his forehand on this clay, with that bounce, he does it very frequently. Finally, they talk about last, uh, last year's final. Let's see. Last year's French Open final was memorable mainly for its one-sided result. 6-0, 6-2, 7-5. Nadal crunched Djokovic, slapped him. In that match, Nadal won 107 points, 25 of them on the third rally shot. Nadal produced eight winners and drew 17 errors from Djokovic on the serve plus one. When Djokovic was serving, he hit six winners and drew only one error from Nadal using his serve plus one because that's how hard it is. Even the great Djokovic has a hard time attacking on that third shot against Rafa. At least he did last year. So I wanted to uh, talk about that because that is that is a very important stat, and that brings Yannick Sinner back into this. His serve is not good enough to set himself up. You know, he has he has uh, the serious firepower. He should be just like Rafa on clay. Sitsipas is doing it well. Able to attack. It's part of how Sitsipas is holding serve so easy to start off that match with Medvedev today. Yannick Sinner, no reason why he can't. I'm sure they're talking about this. I'm sure they're working on it. Too often, you see Yannick Sinner, he can hit a serve pretty hard. And this is where, you know, it's funny, Musetti, when they asked him what he would have from the Yannick Sinner game, he said he, uh, he wants to serve in the return. Well, maybe take the return, but I don't know about the serve because, you know, Musetti doesn't hit it as hard as center, but he hits spots better. And he works the angles better and sets himself up better. Uh, Yannick Center, he puts it in the slot. The slot is, I hit a serve to the corner, but it's not to the corner wide enough to make you stretch out and reach, and now you're not as balanced and able to crunch your shot, Rafa. I hit it in the corner to where you don't have to move. You just turn your hips and unload and hit the ball as hard as you can, and now you have a great return. Too many times I saw Yannick Center hit a serve where he's playing defense rather than attacking on that all-important third shot. Yannick Center was hitting serves to help Rafa. And we see Center, you know, he, when he struggles in matches, right? Some of his matches, you know, he dropped a set to that uh, Gianluca Maga, Magger guy. Who, he was good, by the way, and he was serving really big. That was one of the things I talked about then was saying, like, you see how the Gianluca Major guy, however you say his name, he was hitting big serves that were setting him up, and he was hitting spots better. And Yannick Sinner wasn't doing that, letting him get in. Now, Sinner's so much better rallying off the ground that it doesn't matter against most opponents, but against Rafa, it's not enough. Uh, Rafa did talk about how he was backing up. He was staying back too long and letting Sinner step in and kind of take control in rallies. But Rafa, he fixed that pretty quick, and Sinner's not going to take control of rallies uh, for too long once Rafa settles in and figures out what's going on and what he needs to do. And Rafa is one of the best, probably the greatest problem solver of all time on a tennis court, especially on a clay court. Anyways, wanted to read that and and talk about how Rafa does that. And he's so good at it and how Sinner, that's really the big problem here. You know, Sinner was hitting the ball. You could hear it in the first set, especially when he hit a forehand. It was a lot louder than when Rafa hit a forehand. Uh, let's see. Musetti wasn't really injured. We talked about that. Hit the music. Got to get out of here. But I'll do. I'll leave you with this. Tomorrow, watch out for Berrettini. He is. He is the uh, Italian who might might actually be able to pull off a big upset. Just I mainly say that because it's the night match. He's got a lot of firepower. We'll see. I believe in Djokovic. He's one of the greatest of all time. But uh, that will be an interesting match. I think Djokovic wins it. And since I'm saying everything's in four, let's go with that. 
Here's a comment from a frustrated Fed fan from Shmi841. As much as I'd love Fed playing, as much as I'd love to see him play as long as possible, I gotta say this comeback has been disappointing. Three tournaments played, three early exits. Uh, this fourth round, it's not terrible for a guy who hasn't played in like freaking almost two years. It's sad seeing a legend contesting an ATP 250 event and withdrawing from, well, you know, everyone plays ATP 250s. What, what's sad about that? Even legends play 250s. And withdrawing from a Grand Slam for no solid reason. Well, I think he had a great reason. He's got to save his body for Wimbledon. I mean, if he keeps playing, he risks injury. And on top of that, like, he's got to turn it around and take this advantage, right? When Djokovic and Nadal, who are his biggest threats at Wimbledon, you know, the young guns, they're good. They're starting to show how good they are. But they're not good enough to win at Wimbledon. And they all just look uncomfortable on grass for the most part. Ber Berrettini looks good on grass. And remember what Federer did to him in 2019? He made him slip and fall on his face backwards. Uh, so, yeah, Berrettini's one of the better-looking young guns on grass. Still, he's not there yet to take out Federer at Wimbledon. No matter how good he does here, even if he beats Djokovic tomorrow, I don't think he's good. It's a whole total different thing. And this year, with less time in between Wimbledon and the finish of the French Open, Roger would be crazy not to take advantage. He almost should have skipped the French. He only played because he needs to play some best of five set matches before he goes to Wimbledon to play best of five set matches. The whole strategy of treating every tournament as preparation for Wimbledon is confusing to me. Well, it shouldn't be confusing to you because Federer's only chance at winning another major is pretty much Wimbledon. Maybe the Aussie Open because it plays uh, pretty fast and low now nowadays. What is he planning to do there? Win the 21st major. That's what he's planning. Is he going to beat Novak in the final? Yes, he could possibly do it. He had two match points on him two years ago. I don't think so. He had a fourth round in Roland Garros. He should take it and make the best of it instead of hoping. Roger's not playing to make a quarterfinal. He's playing to win one more Wimbledon. I can't even call it a comeback. This is a preparation for a comeback, I guess. Look, I understand the frustration, but if you knew more about tennis, trust me, if you knew what Roger knew, you would know that Wimbledon's his best chance. He's got to do everything he can to preserve what probably is his very last chance at winning a major. All right, we will be back tomorrow night to talk about the final four at Roland Garros. See you!